and thank you for coming to the first of our case presentation series. Our intention for this series is to create a forum to share interesting patient cases. As a student or even an experienced practitioner, we've all Googled treatment possibilities for patients we have, which may present symptoms we don't see every day. So this isn't necessarily a teaching techniques webinar. This is more of a sharing webinar to offer insight into how acupuncture practice may fit or change or be inspired. Our speakers have years of experience and have been asked to present a unique case which they thought would be interesting to share. A case which encouraged them to look at their acupuncture practice and how it may have challenged it, changed it, or reinforced it. We want to let you know that this presentation will be recorded and made available later this week to view. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat and Dr. Paj will answer them at the end of the presentation. I would also like to invite anyone who is interested in learning more about integrated seminar series courses to stay after the Q&A. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Paj, who holds a doctorate in chiropractic. He's also completed postdoctoral re post residencies in sports med, orthopedic rehabilitation, as well as a two-year acupuncture program. He's held positions with, lectured to, and consulted with multiple professional sports teams, in addition to working with several Canadian Olympic programs. Dr. Pash has authored chapters in and contributed to multiple sports medicine textbooks, as well as many articles in various peer-reviewed journals in addition to being a reviewer himself. As well, he teaches integrated seminar series worldwide. Welcome, Dr. Pash. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Because I can't hear you. You can? Yes, I can hear you. Amazing. Take it awesome. away. Thanks. <laughs> uh, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, for having us. Uh, I know Thomas and I are really pleased to be here and uh, present this information to you. So we will get started. All right, so the case that we've chosen is one concerning hip pain um, in an athlete. So the outline for today is essentially number one, I want to briefly touch on kind of the focus. So what were we really trying to do with presenting this case and what are we hoping to convey in terms of information? From there, we'll go into the actual case itself pretty briefly. So history, physical exam, and diagnosis, and then into the fun stuff, which would be the interventions and what we did in terms of management. We'll take a look at how we did. So we'll, we'll grade our, our efforts and our results at the end. And then I want to double back and I guess emphasize why we chose this case and what acupuncture did for us in this setting. So our focus for today, which I think is keeping with the theme of these webinars, which are honestly such a cool idea. I think, I know I have, and I suspect a lot of other people have gone to the literature and searched for something like, hey, what has, does anybody have a point prescription for shoulder impingement or hip pain or, you know, interesting stuff that people have done from a management perspective? So this is a really nice opportunity, I think, to have um, to have a library of videos where you can refer back to and see what other people have done with respect to managing patients that are similar 
um, in presentation to the ones you have. So uh, in keeping with that theme, we are going to be a little less about the background science today and a little more about the process. So this is essentially a group of content experts. So I don't need to uh, wax poetic about the mechanisms of acupuncture, et cetera. We'll touch on them a little bit because, you know, science, I just can't help myself. Uh, but really the intention is to describe the process that we went through and the utility of acupuncture. So we will reference a couple uh, pertinent papers. So ones that guided our decisions um, in some of the prescriptions that you'll see. Uh, and I also want to highlight today the void that acupuncture can fill for those of us who are not acupuncturists. So acupuncture is an adjunctive modality and that's a CCO rule. We use it a fair bit, um, but I think it's important at least from our perspective, so someone who's not an acupuncturist, to really see how if we understand physiology, we understand process, we can appreciate how needling can have an incredibly profound effect on what we're doing. So essentially, needling is part of a greater or more gestalt overarching plant dimension. All right, so let's take a look at our case. So this is a professional and Olympic hockey player who presented with right hip pain. So she came in to see me and essentially had two overlapping but distinct issues, uh, both in and around the right hip. So she has a longstanding issue of pain, tightness, pinching and soreness around the lateral to sort of anterior hip that she's been dealing with for uh, a number of years, like probably closer to a decade. And more acutely, she had an injury uh, four days prior to coming to see us, um, which I think was probably primarily what prompted uh, her visit, that in proximity in terms of being closer to us uh, geographically because there's centralization and other things that happen uh, during an Olympic cycle. Anyway, so four days prior to her presenting to the office, she was down in butterfly, pushed to slide across to save a puck, and then felt an injury kind of right at the lateral hip above the trochanter. Now, from a physical exam standpoint, uh, we want to rule out anything that was obviously going to um, be something we would need advanced imaging for or potentially co-management for. So chief amongst that would be anything labral. So we screen that, no issues with labral tests. However, once we started getting into physical exam with respect to range of motion and palpation, we noticed some very interesting things. So on that right hip, you can imagine this is a very rotation heavy as well as a very lower extremity heavy sport. So she's a goalie. We had full hip rotation, into external rotation on that right side. But on the left side, we basically had next to nothing. So it was probably generously of five degrees of internal rotation, which is not great if you live in that position when you're in the butterfly, knees down, and your legs out to the side to try and stop a puck. The other thing that we noted was that when we tried to take the hip into flexion, we were limited at roughly 90 degrees and it started to create some pinching and soreness in the hip. So both of those things, the range of motion um, in flexion and the range of motion in internal rotation partially reproduced what was going on with respect to her chronic complaint, so not the, not the acute one. Then we went into palpate and we noticed that we found two very distinct things. Uh, number one was that when we palpated above the greater trochanter into the tendon of the glute med, that specifically produced her chief complaint. And when we went a little bit anterior to that into the glute min, that definitely produced her, reproduced her chronic nagging, aching and tightness uh, that she'd been experiencing again for, for multiple years. So from a diagnostic standpoint, what we labeled her with was a hip capsular impingement slash synovitis. So essentially incarcerating that front part of the joint space, particularly the synovium, which is very pain sensitive. 
Um, we also diagnosed her with a chronic overuse strain of the glute min, as well as a subacute grade one strain of the glute medius tendon. All right, so now that that's out of the way, I'm gonna take a drink of my Harry Potter cup, just coffee. Well, espresso, if you really wanna get technical. But let's talk about the fun stuff, intervention and management. A bit of a background. So our approach, um, or people who practice um, with the ISS system, um, the approach is very much a structural biomechanical approach. So essentially what we're doing is we're gearing our therapy towards restoring optimal movement. We're also big fans of managing cause as well as managing effect. So we're gonna to touch back on this uh, once we get more into the management portion of this, but there needs to be an overriding understanding that there is something pathomechanically responsible for everything someone is experiencing. So it's not just tightness or pain because of bad luck or serendipity, there is a reason for this. So we wanna make sure that we obviously manage things that are going on acutely, but we also wanna make sure that we are providing a balanced approach where we are trying to ameliorate all the things that led to these different conditions. Um, and then again, as I've touched on before, our approach with respect to acupuncture, we use acupuncture on pretty much every patient, um, but it is in accordance with the CCO used by us as an adjunct. There's great benefit to needling as you're gonna see, um, but again, I just want to reiterate the fact that our approach is not a traditional acupuncturist approach because we are not acupuncturists. We're chiropractors who do needle. So it's, so it's different. All right. Now, I guess to give you kind of a broad perspective of how we view the world, um, I like to consider uh, those of us who use the ISS system as pragmatists. Pragmatists in that we identify a list of problems or variables or, or things that are contributing to this person's condition. So some of those are acute things. Some of those are more protracted and have to do with mechanism. But if we take away some of the mysticism and start thinking about musculoskeletal medicine as a series of zeros and ones, as just codes, as just switches that you can flip, um, I think you'll have a much easier time managing not only patients like this or conditions like this, but patients in general. So let's take a look at how that list sort of auto-populated for us. So these are the things that I felt at the time needed to be addressed. Number one, an inflammatory response. Inflammation in some part is good. It's how we repair ourselves. It's why we have such difficulty um, managing things like meniscus and certain tendon things because there is a lack of blood supply to those. So I don't want to completely eliminate an inflammatory response, but I want to make sure that it's, it's in check. The second thing is she was obviously in pain. It wasn't a lot of pain, but pain is present nonetheless. And pain is a bit of a, of a double-edged sword. Um, so some people are better or worse at dealing with pain. So like actually managing psychologically no susception. But it is important to realize that when you are in pain, it affects how you move. That's, that's a big issue. So maybe this person subjectively is not telling you that they have a lot of pain, but potentially that pain is contributing to how they move. So we need to make sure that in some fashion, we are addressing that. So inflammation, pain. What else do we need to do? Capsular extensibility or capsular workspace. So that hip was inappropriately decreased in terms of range of motion and internal rotation and inflection. If you think about the demand that she places on her body, like just from being an athlete, it's Herculean. Uh, at the end of an Olympic cycle is even worse. And the fact that it's a lower extremity sport and she's consistently bent over in hip flexion 
you start to realize that this is going to lead to a lot of other problems. So that had to really be a big priority for us. So we need that range of motion back. From a long-term perspective, we want to make sure that number one, that capsular extensibility that we give her is maintained. And number two, that we do something to affect these tissues so they're able to resist load better. So essentially, I don't like the term prevention because I don't think prevention really exists, but we'll call it minimizing the potential for future recurrences. So that is basically the series of things that we auto-populate and said, these are the things that we have to address right now. So go. All right, a quick review, um, just so we're kind of all in the same headspace with respect to acupuncture. So just by putting a needle in someone, and I think if you look at the soft tissue literature, it's pretty similar. And there's an argument to be made about um, mechanoreceptors affected with both of those, and frankly, with um, exercise and rehabilitation as well, um, all stimulating the same receptor. But if you just quickly sort of give yourself a broad overview, we've got effects that are local, spinal, and supraspinal. So without anything else, we put a needle into someone. We get that stimulus up through the dorsal root ganglion into the spinal cord, into the brain, the thalamic, hypothalamic, pituitary axis, and we start to influence some very interesting things here. Again, similar to soft tissue. So we start to affect things like anterior cingulate cortex, periaqueductal gray, uh, locus ceruleus, et cetera. So all these issues are all these areas that are basically involved in supratentorial processing of pain. So we get an increase in opioids and we have an effect that diminishes pain. From there, we start to get these interesting descending tracks. And when we hit the descending tracks into the spinal cord, we get things like inhibiting glutamate release, um, increased spinal opioids, we're increasing GABA um, and decreasing uh, EAAs. As a result of that, less interleukin-1b, interleukin-6, et cetera. And essentially what we're left with, which again is similar to what you would get with soft tissue, we get a decrease in inflammation as well as a decrease in pain. And then finally, locally, we get, again, a very similar profile of things happening. So beta endorphins and cephalins, things that are um, going to help with neuromodulation of pain. Uh, we affect COX-2, so we're going to get decreased amounts of prostaglandins. We're also going to get a decreased release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and all those things together will result in decreased inflammation uh, and therefore decreased pain. All right, so we have that set as a backdrop. Let's talk about each of these things and what we're doing specifically. So first off, inflammation, as we mentioned, is a normal response to tissue injury. But what it does do is it sensitizes receptors, nociceptors, and then that signal is brought up and we end up getting pain. So problem, solution. A very, this is a very linear process. So I need some form of intervention that is going to manage an inflammatory response. We already just saw that acupuncture in and of itself can do that. Um, but if we do acupuncture at one hertz, we have some very interesting things that happen. So again, I don't want to make this too much of a science-heavy lecture, but I think some pertinent studies are worthwhile looking at. So the first one is a Kim et al. paper in 2006, where they basically matched one hertz and 120 hertz uh, electroacupuncture and found that one hertz is definitely superior. The interesting caveat with that study, though, is when they needled points that were not acupuncture points, they actually didn't see um, very much of a benefit. That's probably sniffing around in from a mechanism standpoint, and you know the reasoning behind that of being you know roughly five times the receptor density in a traditional acupuncture point versus not an acupuncture point. Um, so anyway, interesting food for thought there. There's Zhang paper in 2014, where they found that um, 
anything that was between one and 10 Hertz was actually more valuable than being at hundred Hertz for managing inflammation. And then a limb study from 2016, uh, which found that one Hertz was a better anti-inflammatory um, than basically anything that was a higher frequency. And their rationale was that it was essentially an indirect stimulation of the vagal nerve that was accounting for that. All right, so after that, we got to look at pain. So again, we saw from that first slide that just putting a needle in will help us modulate pain, which is amazing. The other thing to consider is that if we have an absence of inflammation, we're going to have an absence of pain too. So we're actually kind of chipping away at pain just from doing the one hertz uh, that we discussed before. However, in addition to managing the inflammatory response, I also want to affect a higher order processing of pain. Again, it wasn't a massive deal from a subjective measure for her, but it was important based on the implications of being in pain and function. So what we chose to do was a two hertz stim, again, for roughly 15 minutes. So two hertz is an interesting, um, an interesting frequency, is if you look at charts where they studied endorphin and kephalin, dynorphin releases over a multitude of frequencies, two hertz is, and really low frequency in general is kind of your sweet spot. Um, again, from the research, we have an Ali paper in 2020 that found that two hertz will actually maximize pain modulation, essentially through beta endorphin um, expression. Again, it's they just have the biggest release at those low frequency uh, settings. A do paper in 2020 found that low frequency has much stronger analgesic effect than high frequency. In this case, they looked at 100 hertz. And then a ham study, which is actually kind of neat. So two hertz superior to 100 hertz with respect to uh, modulating pain. But what they found was that two hertz actually also reduced the inflammation, which was not something they were, they were looking at. Uh, so very neat. All right. Now we get to myofascial tightness. Um, so as I mentioned before, tightness always has a reason. So there's some form of mechanism that's going on here. Uh, in this case, this was someone with long-standing tightness, which generally meant, at least in our vernacular, that they were putting too much force through it and they were overusing it as a result of other things not contributing a normal amount. So this is something where we're gonna to have to use something other than acupuncture and where um, as someone who's not an acupuncturist, we have uh, access to a fairly wide breadth of interventions that we can use. However, we can cut down on some of the workload that we do if we use acupuncture on these tight muscles. Um, so what we did was an anterior approach to the glute min, where we put um, needles in, stimmed it at 80 hertz for 15 minutes. Again, uh, 80 hertz, and there are different frequencies depending on which papers you use, very similar to percussion research, um, if you've ever used a percussion tool. So, um, you know, it's thought to be stimulatory, relaxing, exciting, a bunch of different uh, frequencies. And the fact is that when people cross those frequency um, thresholds, uh, they still get good results. So it's a bit of, you know, it's certainly not nearly as clear cut as we'd like it to be with respect to an answer. Uh, but this INWI study in 2015 found that 80 Hertz acupuncture was able to reduce muscle tightness. Um, mechanistically, what you're looking at is a combination of acting both on the gamma fibers and the one, one beta fibers or one B fibers, um, and basically facilitating the reuptake of calcium by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're, we're reducing muscle tightness and spasm as a result of hitting that 80 hertz. Um, when they actually went over 80, they found that it was either, at least in this paper, there was either no additional benefit or actually started to get a little worse. So 80 for them was very much a sweet spot. All right, so now, how are we going to 
actually execute this or how did we execute it? Um, patient position, and then where do we actually put these needles? What do we use? Where do we stim, et cetera? So to pull off um, this feat, we essentially had three uh, ES-130 units and then 40 millimeter and 75 millimeter needles. So we put our patient prone, um, had her elbows to 90, arms raised to 90. So essentially her forearms and her hands were flat on the table. Um, put a pretty good size roller underneath her ankles because you'll see in a sec that I'm actually going to access stomach 36, which I can do pretty comfortably as long as the heels or the feet have a decent amount of elevation. Um, we've got a pad underneath just the right hip, which will help elevate it a bit. And as well as on that right side, we're flexing the hip to roughly 45 degrees, externally rotating it, and the knee is at 90. So essentially the medial knee is resting on the table. That's going to give us really good access to the glute min because I want to make sure that I can access that without really getting in and through the glute med. Okay. So for the inflammatory, what we did was 40 millimeter needles uh, at GB29 and GB30 just in the right hip. So our one hertz EA for 15 minutes. The reason why we chose these points is 29. You can actually, if you angle it a bit, can be off of glute med uh, and 30 is well off glute med in the back. And when we patch the EA through, even though the current is having a systemic effect, there are interesting branches of research like Bove and, and other people who are looking at um, directly applied modalities on areas that have an acute inflammatory response, which has typically been very much a no-no. And we definitely don't advocate needling at the spot that's, that's painful. So um, essentially respecting CGRP and other things that, that, can, um, that can complicate the, the biochemical matrix there if you do that. Um, but nonetheless, while I don't want to needle into a place that's got an acute injury, I do want proximity. So even though it's a systemic effect, I do feel that I get a better response from proximity. So basically on either side of where the issue is. So that's basically our first ES unit. Second ES unit looking to modulate pain um, is going to be bilateral points. So LI4s and then stomach 36s in the leg. So LI4 I think is pretty renowned in terms of its uh, ability to modulate pain. So that I think is pretty low hanging fruit for most people that ends up being part of their point prescription if they're trying to uh, ameliorate pain. Stomach 36, the same thing. So if you, if you read a lot of uh, acupuncture literature, that is one that is very commonly used for, for pain. So essentially what we do is um, one channel of that ES unit hooked up to the LI4s, a second channel of that second ES unit hooked up to the stomach 36s. So one unit in the hip, the other two units for, um, the other the other unit and channel is for um, the LI4s and the stomach 36. We're also going to needle, or we did needle the spine. Now, I think a lot of people use spinal points um, if there's an issue with a facet. So there's um, some interesting papers looking at the ability to actually facilitate um, the multifidi using electroacupuncture if you get it you know, deep enough so you're actually at the level of essentially the joint capsule and the multifidi. Um, I would say personally, I feel like it's, it's a little dangerous uh, when you start bringing Lord of the Rings game theory into medicine, meaning one ring or one structure to rule them all. Um, it's not a, a thing that works. It's all the things together that have to work together, which really is, is a big part of sort of movement-based medicine as a whole anyway, is stop being uh, so concerned with one piece, but uh, instead um, sort of paying attention to function of the greater whole. Um, but in this instance, I wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. Um, the spine. 
Number one, I feel like when I can get in and periosteally peck at the levels where those spinal nerves are coming out and supplying the dermatome or myotome that I'm working in, I get a better pain modulation response. I also seem to be able to get a little bit more function on the rehabilitative side. So as a result, we essentially used 75s in a bladder two and 23 um, periosteal pec, and then hook that up to our other channel along with the LI4s and stomach 36s. So those together were essentially our pain channel, if you will. And last but not least, we wanted to do something to affect the tightness. So with the tightness, and you have to be a little careful on this one, um, which the setup that I described should keep you pretty honest in terms of not being um, at the glute med, because I actually don't want the glute med to contract when I'm doing this, but I do want glute med to contract. So in that position where you are prone, the hip is elevated, that one side hip is elevated, the hip is flexed and externally rotated, you can actually get a very clean shot at the anterior fibers of glute med, which is what we did. So three needles basically in front of glute med on an angle so we could access just the glute min. Uh, and then we hooked that up to our final unit, which was um, just, just right there at 80 hertz. <clears throat> so we've got our one ES unit for pain, second ES unit for inflammation, and the third ES unit for tightness. Okay. Now that gives us a pretty good shot at sort of managing the physiology of what's happening here. But again, that doesn't really solve all of our problems. Um, and while there certainly is good research on acupuncture and working on things like frozen shoulder uh, or other capsular things, um, we actually have a, a way that we believe to be uh, quicker in terms of establishing range. Uh, and that is using integrated assessment and specifically integrated patterning, which is the therapeutic side of the assessment. So essentially what we gave her um, is what we call an articular package. So a set or trifecta of three exercises that focus on three different things. Uh, one being mobility, the second one being motor control or competency, so the ability to move through that range, and then finally capacity. So having the joint be able to do work when the demand is higher. And uh, what we found is generally within a couple minutes, we can get from the picture you see on your left uh, to the picture that you see on your right, which is to say full range. Um, whether that's the hip, the shoulder, the thoracic spine, um, generally we can, we can eliminate any issues with range uh, within a couple minutes. So that was part of our uh, part of our intervention. Now, something that we didn't do on this visit, but we did afterwards, which has to be taken into consideration, is um, trying to minimize recurrence here. So, so part of the minimization is you are affecting all the mechanics that went into this tissue doing too much. That's very important. The other thing though, is we also want some tissue adaptation, but this is all presuming that we have finished off with the acute injury part of this and that, that we have normal joint range and normal joint control. So the two things that we really want to affect are the glute min in terms of its ability to accept load. Uh, and the second is the glute med tendon itself. So to do that, we essentially use two things. For the tendon, tendon neuroplastic training, which if you're unfamiliar with that is essentially external pacing. Um, and it's uh, it's been touted pretty heavily by a few different people. So Kubo, Rio, uh, and really kind of came onto the scene with um, Cook and Purdom's sort of just after their continuum of tendon pathology. But having that external pacing is an incredibly neurologically robust way to manage tendon issues. Um, now, it's really one of the only things that will actually increase Young's modulus. So taking a tendon and actually having it not be incredibly stretchy, but having it be resistant, which is what we want. And that's 
especially aided or um, yeah, really especially aided by performing an eccentric load. So you can do it as a as an isometric or as a concentric, but when it's done as an eccentric load, it actually adds a little bit more. The nice thing is we're also going to use eccentrics for um, essentially tissue adaptation. So to make that tissue more able to um, respond to stresses put through it and more able to mitigate those stresses. Um, not only does it give you more in terms of strength profile. So when they've, when they've tested concentric, eccentric, and isometric, um, when you are doing eccentrics, you obviously get an increase in eccentric strength. But what you also get are changes in concentric and isometric, actually more than, than those contribute if you train them, which is pretty neat, as well as some pretty significant changes in the, um, like the collagenous or the connective tissue um, network. Uh, and interestingly enough, you also get a conversion um, to a faster phenotype, so a type 2B uh, twitch fiber, which is pretty cool. So let's see how we did. Immediately afterwards, um, she got up off the table and was better. So range of motion was full, uh, both internal rotation and flexion. That pinching pain was gone. The feeling of tightness was gone. She was able to walk, squat, do a bit of weight shifting and didn't really feel much in the glute med, uh, which is not to say it was completely gone, but it was very much reduced, which was excellent. So we had nothing other than a little bit of residual soreness or tenderness around where that subacute issue with the glute tendon was. So that was immediately uh, post-intervention. And then shortly after that intervention, she had those results, which is pretty damn epic. It's an amazing group of women right here uh, who are absolutely killing it right now on the world stage with a professional women's hockey league, which is just mind blowing because this is now a career option for women. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. And they are amazing ambassadors for the sport. Anyway, you can tell that I'm a dad of daughters because it almost brings me to tears when I <laughs> see that kind of stuff. All right. So acupuncture, what did it do for me? A lot of things. Number one, neuromodulated the pain. Honestly, I don't think there's anything better. Um, and for anyone out there who um, who knows me, um, I am I don't care about being right, but I care about um, being as close to perfect as I can get. And so, whatever the best way to fix, God, I don't like the word fix. The best way to address um, certain issues that's how I'm going to switch my practice style um, because I need to do whatever is going to be the best. And really, I don't think there's anything better than acupuncture for modulating pain, um, which, is, which is really why it's something that we use so often. Um, so modulating pain. Second thing, modulating our inflammatory response. Again, um, there really is just nothing better. Um, it's just a superior modality. So those two things alone made such a massive impact on processing of pain and, and the biochemical environment. It's just a no brainer. Um, and lastly, what it did for me in this case was it lessened some of the work on my old man hands. Um, using acupuncture at 80 Hertz, to essentially fatigue the muscle and bring down uh, some of the tightness in the glute min, because that is a tough place if you've ever worked on it with your hands to actually achieve that depth. It's tough to get in there. Um, so to be able to limit the amount of time I have to spend with my hands at that depth um, is pretty wild. So, um, so many amazing benefits um, with respect to acupuncture and managing this case. Now, in terms of why I chose this case, um, I just thought it was, I thought it was important to highlight because um, there are certainly um, 
which I freely admit people who are acupuncturists whose level of acupuncture knowledge dwarfs mine. And that's, that's okay. Um, because this is not my only intervention and I use it as an adjunct. Um, however, even though uh, I, you know, had a pretty good dosage of acupuncture with uh, Dr. Chu's course, uh, which used to be a two-year course, by the way, back in the day, back in the Stone Ages when we had to use tablets and, you know, a hammer and chisel to take our notes. Um, it's a great course, um, <clears throat> but acupuncture is very much an adjunct, again, which is a requirement for us as chiropractors. Um, but I think maybe people aren't appreciating how good a modality it is because it's not always the first thing that you use. Um, it is just an adjunct. Uh, so I felt like this was an important place where we could highlight how effective acupuncture can be for a non-acupuncturist. I thought this case also did a really nice job of showing how we can synthesize different approaches and different modalities in a more global setting. One of the things I think we, we lack a lot of times is a certain level of pragmatism. So we tend to, to mysticize what we do um, within medicine. It really is just processes and variables. And if we understand the process and we understand the variables, the what do I do becomes very easy because you're just taking something off the shelf, which addresses the problem that you have. You know, you want, you're thirsty and you want water, you get a cup and you fill it with water. It's, it's an easy process. Medicine is a very similar process, but I don't think we're ever really taught to look at it through that lens. So I felt like um, this, was a, this was a good place to be able to introduce that as a concept. Uh, and then finally, um, I think it's important that people appreciate the wealth of acupuncture research, like current research that actually guides the thought process behind how you can be process oriented. Um, again, I, I didn't want to delve too, too much into the basic science because you're, you're all content experts. But if someone ever does come across uh, this video for some reason, um, hopefully they get that. Uh, again, an understanding of that, that acupuncture literature is robust, to say the least. Um, and it really should be discussed in a current setting because, you know, people like uh, Phil She and White have done amazing jobs at explaining what acupuncture actually does from a physiological standpoint in the context of current basic science understanding. Um, so I think it's important that we understand that it is a very current and a very valuable tool. And that, my friends, is that. Thanks so much, Dr. Paj. It's um, really nice to kind of get those reminders, um, especially with somebody that works so much with um, like a very heavy, intensive physical uh, clientele, like all the uh, sports people. So it's a good reminder to see how to be able to pull acupuncture in, even though it isn't necessarily your main modality. Um, so I'll get to, if anyone has any questions, just um, put them in the chat and or in the Q&A, and we can ask those questions. Uh, You have the, there was one that came up. Um, there's a couple of referral questions. If you have any colleagues in the Vancouver area um, that focus on hip pain specifically, and if they're taking patients. There are some great people out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I... Yes, I definitely do. Um, I would need to know like where, um, where geographically they are. Like if, if whoever that is, um, who, who messes that, if you can email me and tell me like specifically geographically where you are, um, there are a lot of really good people. 
on the West Coast. That being said, I'm sure everyone knows um, that they wouldn't be able to needle because that's not in, at least it's not in a Cairo um, um, jurisdiction out there. So they, they wouldn't be able to do acupuncture, but they are amazing at um, soft tissue rehab and assessment and such. So yeah, I can definitely uh, find you a person. And I think that kind of answers another question that was asked um, for somebody looking for a, a Cairo colleague in Vancouver that has a similar perspective in using needles first. So if Cairo's can't needle in Vancouver, that kind of takes away that possibility. Yeah. I mean, you can like, you can, you can play with the, with the neurology side of it. Um, because a pointer plus, um, although it's depending on the one you get, um, like the one that, that we use is locked at 10, which I like 10 Hertz. Um, but you can actually use that as acupressure. So you could actually run, um, a like similar sort of setup, like using actual acupuncture points with the pointer plus, which is super valuable for people who don't want to get needle or are scared of needles. Um, so I do know some people on the West coast that use the pointer plus in that, um, in that same type of manner. So yeah, again, if, if whoever that is can <clears throat> shoot me an I'm email and tell me where you are, then I will do my best to find someone. That'd be great. Um, we have another question um, regarding the glute min needling. Um, 45 degrees from perpendicular directed anteriorly? Uh, yeah, so I am not going like... Um, I'm not going perpendicular to the skin. I'm, I'm coming from an anterior approach. So anterior hip coming on a 45 degree angle to try and basically get in behind into glute min and stay away from, from glute med. I think that was the question about why the 45 degree, because they're saying that they would usually needle between the trochanter and the iliac crest. Yeah. Um, you but totally do. is straight down. So the the thing is, um, based on based on sort of like three dimensionally how like people like glutes stack up. <clears throat> if you read a, um, I'm sure I have one. Oh yeah, God, I have so many anatomy books. It's crazy. But if you read a sort of regular two dimensional anatomy book things are presented in a way that's very easy to learn, but it very much uh, downplays the three-dimensional relationship of how these things actually exist on a human. So if you, when you look at an anatomy book, it's basically a pelvis cracked this way or an ilium cracked this way. And those muscles are incredibly discreet. The truth is in a three-dimensional human being, there is a lot of depth. Um, and the depth makes it such that glute min and glute med are in very close proximity. So you could definitely go through like, like a regular sort of approach that you, that you would take. But what I didn't want to do was get anywhere near um, the glute med. So going anteriorly and then driving it from the front allows me to get just into glute med, just into glute min and leave glute med alone because that's where the subacute injury was. So I didn't really want the glute med doing this for 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, do you usually address <laughs> inflammation, pain, and myofascial tightness at the same time with electroacupuncture? Um, how do you find your approach works when done one at a time within one session or with sequential sessions? <sighs> That's a great question. Um, that very much, um, that, that very much depends on how much time I have. Um, I, I take way too long to do things. That's my wife. Um, so I always prefer to sort of take my time and do things in steps. Um, but depending on how much time someone has and whether or not they're actually in the clinic or I'm out in the field somewhere, that will depend. So I would tell you that um, the contracts that I run for 
um, uh, well, we'll just professional athletes will just look at them. So the contracts that I hold for them, that is me going to some, somewhere in the U S for a couple of days. So I basically have an entire day to just do whatever. So yes, if I have that much time, I'm very much like targeting one, then the other, then the other, then the other. Um, in a clinic setting where you've got an hour to do your assessment, come up with a plan, tell someone what the plan is, have them agree to it after you've done a report of findings, execute it, have them get up and retest it. That's, that's tough. Um, so if I were to take those three things and branch them out, then all of a sudden just those three interventions without anything else have me at 45 minutes, which then makes it like an hour visit untenable. Um, so I think I would, <laughs> I would say, I don't know how to answer that question, but I actually do know how to answer that question. I'm just lying to myself. Um, I think it is better if you separate them out. Um, I just don't have the luxury of that time sometimes. Um, so yeah, I answered my own question. Yeah, I'm dis- <laughs> now, and I'm disappointed in my own answer. <laughs> You'll get there. you get there. <laughs> Um, so any thoughts on acupuncture for promoting tissue healing? Um, this person knows you like to use microcurrent for that in the past. Oh, I love microcurrent. I still use microcurrent. Um, it's a great tissue healer. Um, paucity of research, unfortunately, it's a bit hit or miss, um, in trying to find something that's good. Um, but that is a fantastic question. So here's what I would say to that. Um, number one, if you really want to benefit from, actually, let me, let me put it the other way. Why would I choose to use um, a one Hertz Accu versus um, a microcurrent? Number one, if it was a regular microcurrent, I choose Accu every time. Um, if it was a frequency specific microcurrent, that would make that decision a bit harder because it is an amazing modality. Um, but I still think in a 20 minute, like I can only use one or the other, I would still use acupuncture. If I was able to send them home with it, then I choose frequency specific microcurrent without a shadow of a doubt because it very much collects a head of steam as it's on someone for, for a while. And frankly, even if I had someone at my disposal for eight hours, like I'm in a hotel and and seeing someone in a hotel, I can't acupuncture them for eight hours, but I can FSM them for eight hours. Um, So it's, there's, there's certainly pros and cons to doing each one, but yeah, microcurrents, great. As long as it's the frequency specific, the regular one is utility sort of, it's okay, but it's not, it's certainly not acupuncture. So like a combination, you would do a clinical acupuncture treatment and send them home with the microcurrent? I'm a combination everything. Right. I'm like I'm <laughs> like the kitchen sinker of kitchen sinks, whatever I can throw at you. Uh, yeah, because you know what? I think, and that's kind of one of the things I want to, to get across, which hopefully was successful in the presentation, was um, I think if you're process-driven in your in your logical in terms of like these are the things i want to affect like just let me find a modality that that does this like if you are if you have a bruise everyone goes to get ice it's like a very like it's a very linear process um and most of the things that we deal with are very linear with respect to process we just have to think about what we're doing so i essentially take a look at like auto populating that list of things i want to affect in someone and then I look around and I say, what are all the things that I have that can accomplish those goals? So, yeah, ideal world, they accurate and they microcurrent it. More the merrier. <laughs> um, what are the advantages to using the high frequency needling on the glute min prior to using the internal rotation patterning drill? Um, so the 80 hertz um I use a fair bit depending on um, obviously depending on who it is and, and where it is, you'll, you'll find 
commonality of certain tissues that are tight, especially if someone is prone to not moving well, or you haven't like had a chance to uh, make them move optimally, or if it's someone who does a very specific, like high demand repetitive um, movement. So whether it's vocational or avocational, if you throw a baseball for a living, if you play hockey for a living, if you, you know, things like that, that are, that are very specific. So what that does is it really cuts down for me, the amount that I have to use my hands. So the glutes, uh, which is why I thought this would be uh, a, a smart case to do this on, glutes are an area where most people really get exhausted in their hands from like consistently having to work hard at depth when there's a ton of tissue resistance. So if I can go in, plug in 80 hertz, let it run for 15 minutes, and then it's much softer when I go in to do my job, then there's far less resistance, which means less manual pressure, which means uh, less like impact on me. It typically feels better for that person rather than you having to sort of barrel through all this tissue that's been, uh, that's been tight um, as a result of either overuse or trying to protect the articulation underneath it. Great questions. Okay. Um, do you have the ES-130 in front of you? And could you explain how to set one hertz, two hertz and higher? Uh, where's my bag? I don't. Um, they're either at, I'm not in my clinic. I'm in my, uh, in my cave. <laughs> which is my aka my office and my house uh so no i actually don't have it with me however if you if you grab the es-130 you'll see that there's a chart of three numbers on the front um it will tell you the intensity on the right and the hertz on the left so there'll be one column for low medium and high so if you go to low you'll see the intensity that you have to turn it up to, which will match to the Hertz on the left side. So it's not like, it's not like the, um, <clears throat> the intensity, the intensity is just how much you, sorry. Intensity is just how much you feel. It's the, the frequency rather. So there's three columns um, plus the frequency on the side. So the, the frequency number on the far right will give you the actual numbers on the dial. And those numbers on the dial, if you read over, will tell you what frequency they are actually tuning it to. So it's it's pretty pretty simple. Although I just made it sound so stupidly complicated. Um, <laughs> um, hey, think about it. I'm in clearly I'm an idiot and I could do it. So you'll be fine. Um Okay, so for the 45 degree needling, what direction specifically is the um, is the point the needle towards? So is it towards so, which sacral level? So I am basically putting it right in the glute min. So between the anterior part of the greater trochanter and call it essentially the ASIS in the front. So if I was to go in straight laterally, I would have to go through like glute med to get the front part. So instead of going perpendicular, I go 45 degrees anteriorly. So I'm sliding it in and behind glute min to access glute, sorry, sliding in and behind glute med so that it accesses glute min deeper down. So it's basically a way to get in through the front rather than going straight through glute med. Okay. Um, so for the pain modulation, what are you using as your cue for intensity at that setting? So as soon as they Great feel question. it, strong but comfortable, as much as they can tolerate? Great question. Um, I generally only stop when I see smoke or fire. <laughs> Uh, no, it's a great question. Um, so typically I will say, um, and, and you know, if you've used that unit before, especially if there's a fresh battery in there, 
man, you got to be careful turning that sucker up because you can go from nothing to all the feelings in the world in like two millimeters. Um, so I will tell them what they're going to experience. So generally, um, especially for like the one and two hertz, or even, um, you know, sort of in around that area, I'll say you're going to feel what feels like a tapping. So I slowly budget up. And once they're like, oh, yeah, I can feel it. And you'll also see the muscle contract. Um, and then generally my instruction is I want it, I want you to feel it like it should be should be noticeable, but I never want it to be painful. So I want it at a comfortable level. As long as you can feel it and it's at a comfortable level for you, then that's good. I don't want this. Like I'm a, I'm a very big proponent of whenever possible. And some points are obviously uh, don't allow that or some conditions don't, don't allow that, but whenever possible, painless acupuncture. Um, I just, it's, think psychologically not a great place for someone to be if they're, they're like oh god i gotta go back into that place where the guy is a jerk to me and he drinks coffee all day and he sticks me with needles and it hurts uh all those things are true except for the needle part uh hopefully um so i don't want them to be at the point of pain and i don't think there's actually any not only do i not think there's benefit in going above what they can tolerate i think there's detriment to doing that um, so one of the things that, that we routinely talk about in um, our, our other seminars is the effect of like essentially like, like um, supraspinal sort of mechanisms guiding pain and guiding tightness. Um, and so there we oftentimes reference a study where people came in to um, get assessed and it was a it was a decent sized trial actually, and they had people self select as being very anxious or very calm, and so those people were then sort of equaled out, trying to make sure that they are roughly age match controls of one another, and then they had a group of assessors come in and palpate them and said, "Does this person is this a tight person or a not tight person?" And they were able to pretty accurately predict the people who were the ones who felt like they were anxious, all palpated as tighter. Then when they go to EMG, those people, um, there's no difference in the EMG. It's just the connective tissue, like wind up in tightness um, from them being very anxious. So if we start creating a lot of discomfort in these people, they're going to start winding up connective tissue as a result of that. And then you end up producing the problem that you're actually trying to fix. Similar to being very heavy with your hands if you're doing soft tissue. If you're like burning the skin and like digging in really hard and you're causing someone like, <laughs> you know, emotional trauma, um, that actually has a deleterious effect on how tight they are. So, yes, it is within comfort. I allow people, as long as they can feel it, to self select whatever they think the intensity is. And people like, people are usually pretty pretty decent about it. I find that most people's like, like happy zone is it'll be on, they'll feel it. And then I'll like, I'll, I will just say like, is that good? Or you want me to bump it up a bit? And like, oh, bump it up a little bit. And you bump it up, you see the muscle going more and they're like, yeah, that's good. And we, um, so in this case, was there any manual soft tissue work? Um, so there was a little bit, but not a whole lot. So I had referenced um, the bow paper, and there have been a couple of people who have published on that. We have tended to very much frown on people using their hands over acutely damaged tissue um, because we felt like it was going to make the inflammatory response far worse. Um, in studying this, it's actually not the case. If you are stretching the tissue unnecessarily yes if you're actually just using your hands uh, to try and create some fluid flow dynamics and actually affect which essentially would probably be myofibroblasts with your hands you can have a local effect where you are decreasing um, neutrophil macrophage activity and tumor necrosis beta one um, which is big because if that comes in, it starts to auto-populate collagen. It's actually what converts fibroblasts into myofibroblasts. And 
when they look to see what the spread of that was geographically, wherever they put their hands and they were working, those effects stayed right there. So they didn't like, it wasn't systemic. It didn't move anywhere. It didn't travel around the body. And in particular, it actually didn't penetrate. So it just stayed at the level. So we did a tiny little bit around uh, the glute need where it was store. Um, we didn't really have to do much on the glute min. We did a tiny little bit, which I would say was more in the realm of movement prep than it was like trying to really like hammer something out. The acupuncture did the heavy lifting. And to be honest, the articular package basically just like knocks it open. So that those two things in particular make um, make the work with your hands like it makes it count and it makes it far less a burden because they both do so much in terms of, of management. Did you do any adjustments? Very rarely. I'm a bad chiropractor. <laughs> Um, again, you know, th this is, it's a funny thing, right? Cause I should, like, I, like, I should be just like running down the street and cracking people all over the place. Uh, Cause that's what is expected of me. Um, so I would say to anyone who doesn't like that, um, it is a pretty wide scope of practice that we have, um, things that are permissible. Um, so I, I definitely never do anything that's not permissible under my under my license. Um, but again, I, I uh, flatter myself to be a pragmatist. So I do whatever actually works. If you have a costal transverse joint something, 100 out of 100 times, I'm adjusting that with a question because it is it does what it's what I think we all, want the adjustment to do which is like instantaneous relief um with that being said i don't adjust many other things because i find that um using my hands to generate mobility and using like active mobility work gets me where i need to go faster and more permanently um so and again like i'm not I also exist in like a fairy tale land that um, that frankly I'm I'm incredible. I don't even know how I got here. It's just very uh, very fortunate. Um, so I work with people who um, can utilize my very narrow um, and somewhat poor skill set, um, and and those people generally that's kind of not what they're after. They're very much like performance. Um, performance based so that's where I do most of my work um, so I have friends who are amazing chiropractors and therapists who adjust all the time and in their populations like their people love it and I think that's amazing uh, I got into this when I wanted to do this job since I was um, I think 12 years old it was the only thing I ever actually wanted to do with my life uh, was be a chiropractor and work in sports um, so I've been very fortunate to have like a, a very niche practice. So the people that I see um, don't want that. In fact, there's quite a few of them who would say like, hey, um, are, is it true you're a chiropractor? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you're not going to crack me, are you? I said, I already cracked you three times. I'm just so fast. You never noticed. No. Uh, so So in my like very odd like like subset of people it's not really uh, it's not really a big thing so i do it occasionally i do it if someone if someone wants me to then i do it because honestly it's a riot i love adjusting people it's fun uh, but it's just not the fastest way to achieve uh what i need to achieve in like in the subset of people i see but this case you didn't adjust right no nope. and how many total treatments were there uh, so the results from this was just the, was just the single treatment, ah. um, that, um, so we saw her then, uh, I think I saw her once at the hotel after that. Um, yeah, I think it was only, it might've been, it might've been three. Um, but 
honestly, the, the heavy lifting was the first visit because the other two were essentially just seeing progress with, with the rehab side of it, cleaning up a couple other things and working a bit on, on the glute meat. So it was more like controlling physiology than it was all the other stuff. There's a very, the, the sort of ISS way of doing things um, with IA and IP is very, very much a behavior-based model. And we're big proponents of what I will loosely call dose response. Um, so my daughters who are 15 and 19, um, my 19 year old learned how to ride a bike in under 60 seconds. She literally went like 10 feet, fell 12 feet, fell eight feet, fell rode a bike. Uh, my youngest, she, uh, took about seven hours, same parents, uh, same street and actually the same bike. And she's a fantastic athlete. So it wasn't like she was, uh, like, you know, like horribly like motor motor behind um but that is dose response in a nutshell one required 60 seconds of input in order to completely permanently burn the motor angrum responsible for riding a bike into her system the other one took seven hours um so a lot of our follow-up visits um with the iss system are really more about ensuring that someone is providing themselves with the proper dosage and that we're turning over the exercises once they have adapted to whatever it is that we've given them so we're, we're big believers in like continually pushing forward with what we're doing from a rehab perspective because you're doing the same three exercises for nine months it's like training for a marathon and running a hundred meters every day on race day. You're going to be great in that hundred meters, but the other 42 kilometers, you're going to have a lot of trouble with. So I guess was, was this patient in the acute stage for the first treatment or did you wait? Nope. She was, I would say subacute because it was four days, but all that was delivered the first day. The only thing I didn't do was the eccentric load uh, and the tendon neuroplastic training um, because it was acute. Now, if it was a chronic thing, it was a, like a chronic tendon thing, we would be hitting the TNT and the eccentric load uh, for the tendon stuff. It's because it has to be, it has to be high MVC. Like you've got to pretty much be maximum, um, which was not something she needed at the time. It would have been inappropriate because there was, you know, some modicum of inflammation, probably a little bit of, of tissue damage, although there was nothing palpable from a lesion perspective. Um, so no, all that stuff was done right off the hop at four days post-injury. Um, I think we just got one question left, which was how did you differentiate gluten meat from men? Was it just by palpation? I was hoping somebody's going to ask me like favorite Harry Potter character or <laughs> house am I in? Nothing. Eh? And then what's yeah. your favorite Harry Potter character? <laughs> you know, it changes. <laughs> I'm going to have to go Dumbledore just because every time I've, so I've read those books eight times, each of those books eight times. He always says stuff and I'm like, man, I wish like I was that like, I wish I was that put together. Like he's just got such a, such a lovely fake man. Um, so how do I differentiate those two? That is a great question. So you can base it on a couple of different things. Um, one is if you are, if you have someone on their back and you flex their hip up to 90 degrees and then you fully externally rotate it, you will actually preferentially stretch glute min and you can feel it tighten up underneath you. Um, in the absence of glute med really tightening up in that scenario. So that's one. Uh, the other option is to basically try and sort of organize yourself where you understand where the greater trochanter is, ASIS is, and essentially use um, kind of what we did for finding the needle, which is go anterior through TFL and then try and come back and palpate fiber direction. Because it's it's they're similar, but but meat is definitely a lot more horizontal at that point versus glutamine's front part, which is a lot more vertical. So that is also a possibility. But it's not it's not um, the one that I described with ninety degrees in rotation is probably the easiest. 
but it is tough because they stack up on each other. And action wise, it can be very similar. So me, depending on the textbook you read is a flexor extender, external rotator, internal rotator and abductor um, versus, versus min, which is, which is much less, but anything that min does Mead can do. Um, so it be, if you were muscle testing for it, it's, it's very difficult. It's really based on depth and being slightly anterior to the Mead fibers or else tensioning them up in the flexion, external rotation, abduction position. Good question though. Um, is it possible to explain what the exercises are in the articular patterns? Oh, or is that a very long list? No, you know, it's, um, I can, I can describe it. Um, um, I just don't know. I just don't, I just don't know how, uh, how much sense it'll make. Given my attempts to try and make sense of stuff that I know already tonight, I'm, <laughs> I will see how well I do. Um, <clears throat> so it's, the the exercises differ based on where you are so like the one for thoracic spine is different than shoulder is different than hip is different than ankle um from a from an overall perspective um i think maybe that would at least be uh moderately helpful what we're essentially trying to do is create as robust a neurological experience as possible that's garnering stability um, which generally means a like a fairly strong contraction, um, right near end range. So um, we think that someone's inability to move through a range of motion in a lot of times comes from uh, the connective tissue tightening up to either protect or uh, because it doesn't believe that you can actually control the range. Um, we see that a lot in people with, with hip OA. Um, so someone with hip away comes in and they can't rotate their, their, their hip. And they say, well, it's cause I have arthritis. And I said, but yeah, but you're like, it's still a ball and it's still a socket. Like you've lost like a thin layer of cartilage, but like, why should that mean that you can't rotate your hip? Um, and so what we do is we have them work very hard at end range, make it neurologically robust. The joint is centrated. We're getting a significant amount of neural drive backwards. Um, and the patient is doing it without being in any pain. And as a result of that really strong burst at end range, you end up relaxing the connective tissues significantly around it. You then go to the new end range and repeat. Essentially, you know, you can sort of think of it as like ratcheting further and further into the range you want to go into until it's full. Again, that's, that's one part of it. Um, so that would be the mobility. On the other side is control or competency. It's essentially, can you move your joint actively? So if someone is incapable of, you know, exerting a motor response and turning their, their arm inwards, and they can only actively move to here, then even if the shoulder capsule or the connective tissues allow this, that this is only ever what your range is going to be because you're only as good as where you can actively go. So the second set of exercises are involved uh, doing that. So there's sort of like speed contraction and a few other factors. And then capacity, um, the capacity part, again, they're all different for depending on what joint and depending on what range you're working on. But it's essentially um, an extension of the first two where we're working very hard at end range in a controlled environment, uh, trying to capture the fantastic uh, information that has come out of uh, looking at the different contraction profiles. So isometrics in particular. Um, and if you play with muscle length, position and time under tension, so overall single effort volume, it's, um, it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. Um. The last question is just to clarify, were all three Eason units um, used simultaneously? Yep. All right. 